So, let's talk about stellar corpses, the stellar graveyard, the things that are left behind by stars when they die. So, stars will leave behind three types of corpses. Uh, most stars, the vast majority of stars, are going to leave behind a white dwarf star. White dwarf star. So this is an interesting object. This is what our sun will become. It is, uh, it is size of the Earth. Size of the Earth. It is held up by electron degeneracy pressure. Electron degeneracy see pressure um, and that's how it works it's made of mostly carbon most of them a few very low mass stars might be you know uh, helium white dwarfs and so that's what you got that's then material is locked up in the white dwarf that's not recycled the outer layers of the star are recycled as a planetary nebula which then expands and cools and there you go now so these this is what low mass stars so low mass the vast majority of stars now if you're a high mass star five, six, seven, ten times the mass of the sun, now you're going to end in a supernova and create a neutron star. And if you're a really massive star, the biggest of the big stars, 20 times the mass of the sun, then when that's undergoing a supernova, that's going to collapse so much and that there's going to be so much pressure there that even the pressure of neutrons cannot stop it. So, so, we'll, so that, that can create a black hole. And we need to talk about black holes because everybody loves black holes. Black holes are cool. So, neutron stars are a few miles across, a few miles across. They are it's basically a solid ball of neutrons. And then we got black holes. So this is interesting. So we need to talk our way through this. First of all, white dwarfs were discovered you know, more than 100 years ago. First, it was kind of strange. Wow, this is really hot. It's really tiny. It's very dense. What is it? It wasn't until the quantum theory came along that people could, uh, could figure out. Uh, the, the star Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, it's just to the lower left of Orion the Hunter. Nice, big, bright star. Uh, Sirius has a white dwarf companion. It's in a binary system. We can actually see Sirius and its companion orbiting around each other. So they're able to figure out the mass. Wow, it's very strange so white dwarfs exist they can exist if they're in a close binary system a close binary system where you got a white dwarf star and another one then sometimes the other star can throw material onto the white dwarf you know its gravity pulls it in builds up a layer and then it builds up thick enough that then it does a flash of nuclear fusion and can touch things off it can even in, in the right sorts of sorts of things it can make it so that the, the it can even push the if it pushes the white dwarf um, so that's a nova that can happen again and again and then if if it builds up enough on top of that white dwarf where it pushes it over the limit that the, um, that the electron degeneracy pressure can no longer hold it up at all, then the whole thing can explode and you can get a, a different type of a white dwarf supernova can, can result from that. So that's, those are interesting things you get out of white dwarfs. But we need to talk about neutron stars. So if I have, so neutron stars, neutron stars, the theory of them was figured out back in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, Fritz Zwicky was one of the great astronomers behind that. They've worked out the theory of neutron stars. It explains this idea of supernova explosions. Awesome, wonderful, neutron stars are cool, they're great, they're wonderful. And then they calculated that, oh golly, because these things are only a few miles across, they have tiny surface area, so even they're just wickedly, amazingly, fantastically hot. The total luminosity, the amount of light energy they're giving up, well, that's, that's a function of two things, your temperature and your surface area. And these have trivial surface areas, so they discovered, oh, it's a new type of star, and we could never actually ever see it or detect it in any way ever. So, bummer. So, we can't actually test this theory. So, oh, it's a hypothesis. Oh, very annoying. And so that was, that was the thought, you know, so this is predicted in the theory, 30s, predicted, predicted in the late 30s, people study them through the 40s, you know, they're doing the nuclear stuff, they do all this sort of thing, Psh, never mind. All right, guess we can't test that, move on to other things, people forget about it. And then a generation later, in the late 1960s, late 60s, a graduate student, her name was Jocelyn Bell, Bell was using a new type of radio antenna. 
and she's using this new type of radio antenna that can pick up radio signals that change very quickly over time. And most, you know, stars can give off radio waves and big clouds of gas and dust can give off radio waves, but most of them don't change quickly over time. So she's got this new sort of thing, and it's a great big radio antenna array of these things out there. She's a graduate student, so she's doing this under the direction of a professor, and it's kind of part of her project to, to become a doctor of astronomy, all that kind of thing. And she's measuring this stuff, and she finds that, and, and it's recording the radio signals and basically like a seismograph tape, you know, like they do for recording earthquakes and things like that. And so then as it's set out in the field and then as the earth rotates, it points at different objects, very low tech sort of thing in that way. And it's coming across and she discovers that every day at a certain point she gets a little bit of scruff. Uh, that was her word, a little bit of scruff on the tape. And so she's got interested in this. What could be behind that? Why would, why would it something be varying very quickly. So she set it up so that when it was going to come to that point that the tape would move much faster and burn through a whole day's worth of tape in just a very short period of time. And she found that there was a source in the sky that was producing regular pulses of radio waves. Regular pulses of radio waves, like basically one a second, one per second which was amazing. I mean, you know, like, okay, the sun spins around once every month, and so its radio waves change once every month, but good grief. Uh, to spin around once a second, how could that happen? So she talked to her advisor in Nihilish, and they can't figure it out, and so they kind of half-jokingly say, well, the only thing we can think of would be maybe like an alien civilization trying to send a beacon out there, you know, regular pulses of radio waves. So they named the source LGM-1, standing for Little Green Men Source 1. It was kind of a joke, but they had nothing else. They had no idea what could produce regular pulses of radio waves on a regular, you know, just, just ticking once every second sort of. How do you do that with a star or a planet or a cloud of gas and dust or these things that we know are out there? And so they, they, didn't, they didn't tell everybody about the, the, their, their idea, but that's what they called the source, LGM-1. They start talking about and then somebody remembers. They're talking to different colleagues. Any idea about this? Somebody remembers the theory of neutron stars and thinks, wait a minute, wait a minute. If, uh, if it's, you know, the core of a star, a massive star is going to collapse into a neutron star, well, that's going to make it rotate very fast. For the same reason that, you know, like when an ice skater is spinning around and then the ice skater brings his arms in and he spins faster and faster and faster as he does, as you shrink smaller toward your axis of rotation, Conservation of angular momentum means you have to spin faster and faster and faster. And so, if you've got a core of a star which is going to collapse into a neutron star, that's going to collapse by, you know, factors of, I don't know, many thousands. It's going to be tiny compared to what it used to be. So that will amplify any spin. And while you're doing that, it's also going to amplify any magnetic field. Take the whole magnetic field of the star, squish it into an area a couple of miles across, and that's going to be a wickedly strong magnetic field. So you have a star. Now, this is something they didn't realize back in the 30s. They didn't think about that. So now you've got your neutron star with an amazingly strong magnetic field rotating at colossal speed. And so a rotating magnet, a spinning magnet, will give off radio waves. Basically, it's kind of like if the poles of the star, the magnetic poles of the star, are not aligned with its axis of rotation, then as it spins around, you see that north magnetic pole comes spinning past you, and from our perspective, you know, you kind of see it flashing past, and so it gives off a pulse of radio waves every time the magnetic pole comes past. And they calculate, well, how fast would it be spinning? Well, ballpark, once a second. And so the strength of the magnetic field and all this, it just worked. It fell into place. So Jocelyn Bell and her advisor, Anthony Hughes, uh, discovered neutron stars. So observationally, they discovered pulsars, and pulsars theoretically then can be explained as neutron stars. Beautiful, wonderful, amazing discovery. And then they discovered that the real smoking gun came when they found pulsars inside supernova remnants. So, so they found other neutrons, you know, the other pulsars, and they found that there were several of them in places where there had been known to be a supernova that took place many hundreds or thousands of years before, and then it's just beautiful. And then it makes sense. This theory that, you know, supernova explosions are really neutron stars collapsing, all this sort of thing, it all falls into place, and now we find lots of them. And we find them all over the galaxy, and we find them not only through their radio pulses, but if they're in a binary system. You can have a system where you've got hot gas, falling from a regular star onto that, you know, kind of like with the, with, the, with the white dwarf sort of thing, except now that it gets so hot as it spirals down to fall on top of that neutron star, it can give off x-rays. And so there are basically two ways we can observe neutron stars. We can observe them, observe as pulsars, and we can also observe them, observe as x-ray binary star systems. 
uh, systems where you have two stars. One's a neutron star, so one went supernova and somehow the other star survived. And then the other star's material gas is falling onto this and then gradually spiraling onto this, this neutron star. And as it does that, this material gets really, really hot and it gives off x-rays. And, of course, there's one more thing that a star can turn into when it dies. A high mass star, the biggest of the big stars, when they go supernova, supernova can have so much pressure at the center that what happens is that even the pressure of the neutrons can't stop it. And nothing can stop it, so it can turn into a black hole. A black hole is an object with gravity so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape. An object with gravity so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape. And light is the fastest speed in the universe, so if you can't go the spectrum the speed of light, well, psh, then nothing can ever escape for it. So what happens is the mass of the black hole is crushed into a single point at the center called a singularity. Singularity. That's, that's the heart of the monster. Uh, it's, it has no size, but it has some amount of mass, but it has no volume at all, so it's a point of infinite density. And then this is surrounded by what we call the event horizon. Event horizon. This is like, you know, this is like kind of a sphere surrounding that, and that's the point of no return. That's the point. As you get closer and closer to it, you know, the escape speed necessary to get away from it gets faster and faster. And this is the point where once you're inside that, then you would have to go faster than the speed of light to escape, and nothing in the universe can go faster than the speed of light. And so, therefore, once you're inside the event horizon, you can, if you're outside of the event horizon, then you could, you know, you can orbit around the black hole in a stable way. You can come close to it and then fly back far away. Uh, but once you cross that event horizon, game over, you are, you have, you have effectively left our universe. You're going to be crushed into a single point in that singularity. Your mass will now be added to the black hole. The more mass a black hole has, the bigger its event horizon is. So black holes vary in size. Your typical, you know, smaller black holes might be a few miles across, and then as, as they gobble up this more and more mass falls into them, then they're going to have larger and larger and larger event horizons. So, how do we test this? This is theory. This is an idea. How do I know the black holes are real if nothing, not even light, can escape? And I'm an astronomer. I use light. I use a telescope to find things. Black holes. And then where's the evidence? Evidence. Well, first of all, uh, if a black hole is off by itself, it's going to be gosh darn hard to detect. To detect. However, we find them in binary systems. We know there's a limit to how massive a neutron star can be. So if I find a binary system and I've got a regular star orbiting around another star, except we don't see the other star, and that star has more mass than any neutron star could have, I could say that's probably a black hole. So binary systems, we can find it by the, the, its orbiting companion. And then even better than that, we, black holes also produce X-ray binaries. X-ray binaries. As material from the uh, from the normal star falls in toward the black hole, it's going to end up orbiting a black hole in a disk. So this disk of material will be surrounding there. And in this disk, uh, the material close to the black hole will be orbiting faster than the material farther away. So there will be friction in this disk. This friction has two effects. First of all, it makes the disk get really, really, really stinking hot because the orbital speeds are getting closer, being fractions of the speed of light. And then since energy is being turned into heat, now that gives off. It's so hot it can give off x-rays. So it has to be millions of degrees. And then the other thing is, since it's losing energy, now this causes the material to spiral in. This allows the black hole to feed as material spirals in in this disk around it, getting closer and closer and closer, falling closer to the black hole. And this only this would only happen in a disk. If you have, you know, like a black hole all by itself, and you know, you, you could orbit around that perfectly stably. Black holes don't suck things in. They have gravity just like everything else. They have perfectly ordinary gravity. But if you're in this disk, smoothly, lots of gas smoothly filling space, then friction in the disk can cause things to spiral in. And so then we see these things. We can, based on these x-ray binaries and the temperature of their x-rays, we can then measure the characteristics of the black hole. Based on the orbits, we can measure the masses of the black hole. And we've found many, many black holes throughout the universe. They're real. They exist. And we can find them everywhere.